Micah 7. Micah 7 is where we will be. We'll flip around a little, but not much. If you've got a tassel, you can throw it in Psalms. Have those highlighters out, which have been provided. Micah 7. If you are a note taker, or you need to kind of understand where we're going to be at today, who is God to you? And journal that down. For our small groups tonight, this is what we will be talking about. Who is God to you? If you're a note taker or journaler, you want to you write down with me our bird's eye view of where we've been for two months in Micah from one to seven. This is our last week. We see the judgment, the power of God. We see the hope in his son. And then as we close today, the closeness of a father. The power of God, the hope in a son, the closeness of a father. Who is God to you? Last week in Micah. Chapters 1 through 7, we begin with Israel, Judah, inviting disaster. You remember that saying, God is coming. God is coming. We fast forward to chapters 4 and 5, and the message of hope is given that not only is God coming, God is here in the midst of your punishment. Last week, if you were here with us and the dirty snow has finally melted, but Micah pulls us back to the reality of our existence in the midst of our sinful nature. And he says, do not be deceived. Do not be blinded. Your religious activities will not save you. Do not be the man. Do not be the woman of Matthew 7 and stand before the Lord and say, man, didn't I do this? And didn't I do this? And didn't I do this? If you were here last week, what does it take to get you off my back? Remember? Like, what will make you happy? Church services, 10%, 11%, you want my firstborn kid? Remember? Do not be the individual of Matthew 7. Lord, what can I do to still live in a lost, sinful world and satisfy you? And the answer is nothing. Man, I've been reading and studying and praying and preaching through Micah. And I've loved it. Man, Micah is bringing it like every single Sunday. He is preaching hard. But I want you to go back to Micah 1. We're going to end, but I want you to see the beginning. Look at Micah 1, verse 1. Micah 7, he's near the end of his life. He's an older man. He's been in the ministry. He has a nice resume. Look back. And Micah 1.1, 1, 1. the word of the Lord that came to Micah of Morseth in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. I want you to remember who Micah is in the midst of all of this as we start to close. Micah in chapter 1, it says that he is a young man thrown into the ministry, given a word from God. He preaches under three different kings, three different environments, 60-something years. Historically, it shows us that, all while preaching a message that very few people want to hear. So it is one thing to stand up on a Sunday morning and bring it to people who chose to come. He preaches for 60 years a hard message with the audience not really caring. Have you ever said anything on deaf ears to a child, to a team, to a church, to a loved one? Have you ever said anything and they were like, stop lecturing me 60 years 60 years I'm sure that Micah is tired I am sure he is frustrated I'm sure that he is weary of a 60 year ministry with people who don't want to hear chapter 7 first three words woe is me 
Woe is me. The power of God, hope of a son, the closeness of a father. Man, I love chapter 7. I'm going to be honest with you for a minute. I was almost kind of worried in a way. I'm an energized individual. That's how I work. And during Sunday school, I go to my office and I rehearse, I preach, I teach. I try to make sure my mind is ready. And man, I went hard alone in my office. Like to the point, like when I got done, I was tired. And I was like, man, I'm already gassed because I love this chapter. I love how this book ends, Bird's Eye View. Where we've been for two months, Bird's Eye View. Israel, Judah, fake followers, the world, the coming Messiah, the Savior of the world, the coming King of the world. I mean, he has covered a lot of ground. Micah, this Old Testament prophet in a book that the high majority had very little knowledge of before we started this journey, he's covered everything. Micah, in seven chapters, literally has covered the universe. Last chapter, what is bigger than the universe? Israel, Judah, how we define faith, the coming Savior, the coming Messiah, God's return. He has covered it all. One last chapter. What else is there to say? What could Micah touch on that he has not touched on already? Look at verses 1 through 7. Power of a God, hope through a son, closeness of a father, Who is God to you? Look at verses 1 through 7. Micah says, woe is me. Woe is me. As he closes, woe is me. For I am like those who gather summer fruits. For I am like those who gather summer fruits, like those who glean vintage grapes, and there's no clusters to eat. Of the first ripe fruit which my soul desires... The faithful man has perished from the earth. Highlight that. This is his mindset right here. Now, understand the moment. Like, this is a lot of emotion, and it shows us the place that Micah's in. This isn't the days of Noah. There are people there who love God. But he looks at the climate out his window, and he goes, Man, there is no one here that loves the Lord. There is no one upright among men. They all lie and wait for blood. Every man hunts his brother with a net, that they may successfully do evil with both hands. The prince asks for gifts, the judge seeks a bribe, and even the great man utters evil in his desire. So they scheme all together. You see the picture that he's painting? The best of them is like a briar. The most upright is sharper than a thorn hedge. The day of your watchman and your punishment comes. Now shall be their perplexity. Don't trust a friend. Do not put your confidence in a companion. Guard the doors of your mouth for her who lies in the bosom, for her dishonors fathers, daughters rises against mothers, daughter-in-law against the mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his own household." You see the picture of the climate and the emotional state that he's in? But highlight, underline, do whatever you got to do. Run to the lobby, grab one, and come back. Seven, which everything hangs on this morning. Therefore, I will look to the Lord and I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Man, write that down, me. Exclamation point. Israel, Judah, the universe, chapter 7, last leg of the marathon, woe is me. Chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, Micah is swinging for the fences. He's 60 years into this gig. He's near the end, I'm sure. On the last leg, he looks at the climate and he goes, guys, I don't even know if you're worth it. 
Like, I've done this for a long time. I don't know if you are worth my energy. I don't know if there's one good one in the midst of you all, right? If you've ever read Jonah, it's literally this Jonah moment. Like, I don't want to go to Nineveh. I don't want to do this. Your leaders are evil. Your government's corrupt. Like, even the family is folding on one another. Woe is me. I love this thought. This is what really just moved my affections. There is no universe talk. It's just one man and it's God. There's no Israel. There's no Judah. There's no the temple. It is God and him. You ever seen a strong person cry, like for the first time? Like maybe it was your father, maybe it was your grandfather that you thought never slept. He worked 27 hours out of 24. He was a strong man, and maybe it was his father's funeral, and you looked over at him, and you go, oh my goodness, is is my dad crying? You ever seen, maybe it's your mother who is strong and she has lifted that family for a long time. You ever seen her break? Maybe it was your grandfather, maybe it was your boss, maybe it was your friend, but have you ever seen that person that you didn't think had tear ducts cry? This is kind of the moment in Micah 7. Like I have been literally entrenched in this book and Micah has not mentioned Micah until now. We're on the last leg and he goes, guys, I don't even know if I want to finish this book. Like he's done, man. I'm tapping out. You're not listening. You don't care. I don't know if you are worth it. Being faithful can be tiring in all aspects of life. Literally, Micah is on mile 25 of the 26-mile marathon, and he's thinking about walking. You know, this really touched me as as a pastor. As a pastor, someone in the ministry, like I feel, I believe that God has blessed and given me passion and desire and stamina to do this. I am Filled, church, 99% of the time. I am psyched for doing this. And in the midst of all of that, there are multiple times a year I look at my wife and I go, I don't know how much more I can time I can do this. Like, I got no more thoughts. I got no more ideas. I have no more creativity. I have no more energy. Like, as I say amen today, my mind goes right back into the next message. It never stops. It drains you. And it breaks pastors. And I am talking to you as someone who is energized 24-7. Multiple times a year, I look at my wife and go, I don't know, I could be a banker. Faith in ministry can be tiring. But it's not just ministry, it's all aspects of faith and obedience in our walk. And it's tiring to be a faithful husband. It's tiring to be a faithful mother. It's tiring to be a faithful child. I'm going to be real transparent with you. There are days where I am full and there are days where I am empty. There are times where I am tucking in all my kids and I don't want to read the Bible or pray with any of them. Just go to bed. Like I'm tired. I've done Jesus all day. I don't want to do this right now. You ever feel that? I hope I'm not the only one. Maybe you should be up here. Like, is there ever a day? We have an upstairs. We go upstairs and everybody's together. So the mood of one impacts everybody. And as I walk up the stairs, I can see every room. And sometimes I'm reminded of my tank being on empty. Because I can see every room, and when I see every room and every child in bed, I have one thought. Go in there, read the Bible, and pray. And sometimes I do, and sometimes I don't. Like, it's hard. It's hard to be faithful. You can be tired and exhausted and weary. It's hard in this call to love others. There's days that I don't even want to like those, but I don't love them. To be selfless and to serve. I wake up some days and my only plan is to be selfish. 
Like, I'm not talking about, man, it's just hard to be a pastor. It is hard to be faithful. Seven days a week to be the dad, to be the mom, to be the friend, to be the Sunday school teacher, to be the co-worker, to be the witness, to be the friend, to be the child. You can be tired at times. Woe is me. And then there are moments, guys, man, I am on fire. And I am waking kids up going, I know we already prayed once, but let's pray again. And there are times where I am a good coworker, friend, father, and husband. In the midst of those moments, I at times feel alone. Because I look out in the midst of all the people, and at times I see individuals in the same season that I once found myself in. There are times when faith and obedience is exhausting. No matter your calling. He says, woe is me. I told you to highlight verse 1. Go back to it. What does he feel like? What does Micah feel like? For I am like those who gather summer fruits. Like those who glean vintage grapes. But guess what? There's no clusters to eat. Of the first ripe fruit which my soul desires. You know what Micah's saying? Like, man, like, I am working my tail off, and I'm starving. You ever felt like that in your walk? You ever felt like that as a mother? You ever felt like that as a wife? Like, I, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying, and I'm burning out. Now go to verse 7. I told you to highlight it. In the midst of my weariness, in the midst of my discouragement, in the midst of my second guessing what I'm doing, therefore I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear what? Me. My God will hear me. No universe talk. Me. Nothing in God's word is mistakenly placed. Nothing without a life-changing message. God chose verses 1 through 7 to be in there for a reason. Micah 1 through 6. Israel defining faith. The coming savior of the world. Chapter 7. Woe is me. God's widespreading message touching every aspect. Think about Micah. Greg Milner and I were talking about this right before Sunday school class. Chapters 1 through 6, Micah is touching on every vantage point of the human condition and our existence, past, present, and future. He's covering it all. Micah 7 ends with one man and his creator. Micah is so much bigger than Micah. It ends with the messenger and his creator. My God will hear me. My God will hear me. Bird's eye view, ground level. Turn to Psalms 23. I want you to see it for yourself. As you flip, hear Psalms 145. The Lord is near to all who call on him. Psalms 23, go to it. The Lord is near to all who call on him. We're going to read all six verses. So get your highlighters out, your pens out. There's a few words I want to really pour into you guys. 23, 1 through 6. The Lord is, underline, my. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yes, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with who? Me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort 
Me, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It is hard to balance life. And as a pastor, a Christian, a husband, a father, a friend, there are most days out of the week where I feel guilty and burdened at my inability to do so. Like Hunter Jones, the man, cannot balance the universe and Wendy. I can't balance studying to preach the most important thing in the universe as my children run into my office shooting me with Nerf guns. Like, I can't do it. You know how many times I've yelled with this Bible open? Like, I have a hard time juggling the universe and kids. Worldly emotions and godly love for our neighbor. Time and selfish desires. I have a hard time balancing those things. The book of Micah, the message is, to the world, God is coming. God sees you. There will be a savior. One day there will be a king. It ends with, my God will hear me. 1 John 3, 1. See what kind of love the Father has given to us. That we should be called children of God. And so we are. Listen to it again. 1 John 3, 1. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. Micah is tired, frustrated, defeated, and feels alone. Mama, daddy, husband, believer, hear me. But he faced this moment in hope because he had confidence that his father would provide. He was weary. He was defeated. He wanted to walk. But he faced those motions, that moment in hope, because he knew that God was not just the God who spoke to the universe. It was his Father. And there was a closeness in that. So he was able to say, look at verses 8 through 13 in Micah. You saw his mind, you saw his heart, you saw the moment, but look at what he ends with. Verses 8 through 13. But do not rejoice over me, my enemy. I love this, guys. Highlight it, please. When I fall, I will rise. Is that not awesome? When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. Amen? Amen. I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him until he pleads my case and executes justice for me. He will bring me forth to the light. I will see his righteousness. Then she who is my enemy will see. And I shall, and shame will cover her who said to me, Where is the Lord your God? My eyes will see her, and now she will be trampled down like mud in the streets. In the day when your walls are to be built, in the day the decree shall go far and wide, in the day that shall come to you from Assyria to the fortified cities, from the fortress to the river, from the sea to sea to mountain to mountain, and to the land shall be desolate because of those who dwell in it and for the fruit of their deeds. Please, if you've lost me, Micah's hope and assurance in his father shatters any distress that he's in. His belief that God hears him gives him new life. Man, do you hear it? Man, like life is tiring. We talked about it on Wednesday night. It's hard to be faithful. It is hard to finish the marathon. It's hard to fight the good fight. It's hard to pray every night as you tuck them in to love your wife well. It's hard to do this. But Micah's new life does not come from manning up. It comes from his belief that God will provide. Micah's hope shatters his distress. Does this amaze you? 
that does it amaze you that God created life that he has ordained it, that he plans it, that he sustains it, that he provides, and he ends all in the midst of walking with one. Does this amaze you that God loves the one in the midst of the many? As I told you, this message was hard to put together. And it was hard to put together because I myself just felt like I was feeling the chapter more than my ability to communicate it or desire to do so. Like I was reading this and man, like I I leaned on it. Like I don't know if you had strong upbringings of my father was great. My father showed affection and loved me well and poured into me. And not only did he tuck me in, but he did pray every night. I don't know if you had that. I didn't. So, man, as it talks about a father, as Micah goes, hey, listen, man, I know God is having his way with Israel and Judah and fake believers and the temple and the coming and all of those things. He is walking with me. Like, my father, we are ending this. What is bigger than the universe? We end with literally the closeness of a father and his creation. Does that not amaze you? With new hope, strength, Micah finishes what God had him to do. I think at some point in your life, if you are human, you will be tempted to walk. It might be mile three, it might be mile 25, but at some point you're going to be like, I don't know if I want to do this. Either they are not worth it or this is not. And the desire is not to man up, suck it up, be strong. The desire is is that our belief that our God walks with me and that fills me to finish the race. In his last verses, we see God's promise of forgiveness. Look at verses 14 through 20. These are the last verses of Micah. Shepherd your people with your staff. The flock of your heritage who dwell solitarily in the woodland in the mist of Carmel. Let them feed in Bashlem and Gilead in the old days of old. As in the days when you came out of the land of Egypt, I will show them wonders. The nations shall see and be ashamed of all their might, and they shall put their hand over their mouth, and their ears shall be deaf. They shall lick the dust like the serpent. Travis, that's some of that Old Testament smack talk that you and I were talking about. They shall lick the dust like a serpent. They shall crawl from their holes like snakes of the earth. They shall be afraid of the Lord our God, and they shall fear because of you. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? Highlight everything forth. He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. Amen. I love 19 and 20. He will again have compassion on us and he will subdue our iniquities. Your, you will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. You will give truth to Jacob and mercy to Abraham, which you have sworn to our fathers from the days of old. Are you doing anything with this? Micah came at us with some huge, life-changing, crippling, encouraging words. Are you going to do anything with this? The five percentile had a great knowledge base of Micah before you stepped in here. Me being one of them. Has this changed your life in any way? Are you going to do anything with this? Are you closer to the Father? In chapter 7, no matter who your earthly dads are, when you saw this in the midst of all that God had going on, we end with the closeness of a creator and his creation. Does that bring you any closer to God? Like, Do you see how much the creator loves you? He will hear me. Like, Is that God to you? 
Or is God just Sunday morning and you listening and scrolling on your phone and going to lunch? Is that who God is to you? I pray that if you don't know the Lord as Micah knows the Lord in chapter 7, that today you are saved. For my young ones here, if you are in elementary, middle school, high school, college, however old you are, if you are living, eyes on Pastor Hunter. If you believe following the Lord is coming to church and not cursing at school and waiting till marriage, if if that's your ideas on what a Christian is, break them away and understand that the cross is bigger than all those religious activities. Like, I hope you don't do all those things. But hell is going to be filled with people who didn't curse and waited till marriage and went to church. I pray that you read Matthew 7, I mean, um, Matthew 7, but also Micah 7, (laughs) both. And I pray you read that and you just fall in love with the Lord and you see the coming Savior and you await the coming King and you are faithful in your belief that the God who you worship hears you. Let's bow our heads. God, we thank you for today. Lord, as the pastor of this church, I I give you all the praise and glory for this book study. You have been so good to me. You've been so good to us. Lord, I pray for everyone in this building, everybody who listens at home. I feel, as as I talked to Greg earlier, I feel that literally you could point to any passage, any book, any character or reference in the Bible and win. I believe your word is sufficient. I believe it is so wonderful that we can flip in any part and literally be wrecked by it. Lord, I pray that the people heard. I pray, I pray, I pray, I pray. Lord, let us not be hearers and not doers. Lord, I pray that we grow closer to you through this word. I pray that we share with others through this word. Lord, forgive us of our sins. Grow our church. Lord, know that we love you. In your precious and holy name, the church says in harmony. Amen.